Good morning. How is everyone? All right, well, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, chapter 14. Also, if you put your finger in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we'll, our section is Acts chapter 14, verses 21 through 28, but we will be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in a moment. love the wrestle of Bible pages. It's just a good sound. Page 1,273. No, just kidding. It's in my Bible. And the next day, Paul departed with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel in that city and made Many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. After they had passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia, now when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Attilia. From there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. Now when they had gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done through them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles." And so they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Shall we pray together? Father, we thank you for the word. Grateful, so grateful that we can study your word here. And we pray, Lord, your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. Thank you for the things that you want to say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Perseverance has been defined as steadfastness, in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. William Barclay said that it is determination which goes steadily on. Obstacles will not daunt it. Delays will not depress it. And discouragements will not take its hopes away. Charles Spurgeon said, Perseverance is what got the snail to the ark. As we've traveled through Acts chapter 13 and 14, Paul and Barnabas have been on their first missionary journey. They've traveled 1,400 miles to six different cities over the course of 12 months, and their mission trip is now coming to a close. However, prior to coming home to their sending church, Paul wanted to make sure that all the churches that have been established all the churches that were planted, he wanted to ensure that they were left in a healthy spiritual state. And so what would they do in order to ensure that the work would continue? Well, as we read a moment ago, Paul gives to us five essential areas that he sought to pour into the churches to make sure that they were well-founded, that they would be strong when he went back to his sending church. And these are five areas, five essential areas that I think for us as a congregation collectively as well as individuals personally need to apply to our lives. First of all, number one, verse 20. The Bible tells us that they evangelize the lost. Look what it says. And the next day, Paul departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, and made disciples, it says that they returned. Now keep in mind that the last city that Paul had preached the gospel, he was dragged out of the city, stoned by its citizens, and left for dead. You might say his world got rocked. However, Paul the apostle tells us, got up from that situation, 
went right back to that city and continued to preach Jesus to the people. He persevered. He wouldn't be dissuaded. He wouldn't be moved. He found himself doing what God had called him to do. And I do think, like the Apostle Paul, when life knocks you down, when life seeks to throw stones at you with its words, we mustn't be dissuaded, we mustn't be distracted from what God has called us, the church, to do. The reason why we're still here is that God has a job for us to do. And that mission, that job as the church is to preach the gospel. We're called to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew's gospel, the ninth chapter, the 37th verse, he said, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers into his harvest field. We have been called and commissioned by Jesus himself to go and preach the gospel. And this is one of the essentials that the Apostle Paul wanted to absolutely make clear to the churches that were established that you need to be about sharing the gospel, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. In fact, the word gospel, as many of you know, it means good news. It occurs 76 times in its noun form. It occurs 40, uh, 54 times, pardon me, in its verb form. And it simply means to go and share what Christ has done for us. It's called the gospel of peace, Ephesians chapter 6. It's called the gospel that's everlasting, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. It's called the power of the gospel, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. We as the church must be commissioned and super involved in sharing Jesus with other people. Now, having said that, let me just say this. If, If we've been called to go share the gospel, it presupposes that we know the gospel. Do you know the gospel? Do you understand what the gospel is? Now, as you go through the book of Acts, the question then is, what in the world did Paul share with the people that he came in contact with? Let me explain to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us what gospel Paul preached. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, tells us the very message that Paul brought to the mission field. It says, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preach to you, which also you've received in which you stand. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the what? Scriptures. The good news of Jesus is that he paid the penalty for my, notice the word, sins. That's a very important word to note in your Bible. A very important word to note that we incorporate the word sin when we're sharing the gospel. Because our culture at this point is trying to ignore this word. They're trying to water down this word. But if we eliminate the word sin from the gospel, you eliminate your need for a savior. We must be a people that understands the gospel entails that you and I are sinners in desperate need of a Savior. That's the gospel. So if you're sharing the gospel, you need to make sure that somehow, some way, you seek to encourage and incorporate that in the message. Yes, Jesus gives joy. Yes, Jesus provides a glorious, abundant life. But the gospel at its heart is that we are sinners in desperate need of a Savior. We've been separated from God. And the times I'm seeking to share the gospel with people, I'm always looking for that avenue. And it varies from time to time. You know, it's hard. Lord, how do you want me to connect and and, and bring that message that you're a sinner, I'm a sinner, in desperate need of a Savior? And so I'll ask them from time to time, those that don't think that they're in need of a Savior, have you ever sinned before? Well, I don't know. Well, let's ask, have you ever, let's say, lusted before? Well, no, not really. Have you ever stolen before? Well, no. Well, have you ever um, used profanity before? Used the Lord's name in vain before? Well, not really. Have you ever lied before? Because we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And as a result, we must and need 
a Savior. And so Paul the Apostle tells us the gospel is incorporating the word sin, that Jesus came as a substitute to die on the cross in place for us, paying the price for our sins. And then Paul says here that he rose from the dead. That means that the sacrifice Jesus made was accepted by the Father on your behalf and my behalf. Jesus died, Jesus rose again. And as we share the message, understand this, the Holy Spirit bears witness to that message. That simple message of the gospel, the Spirit of God was sent to bear witness to that message and is the power of God unto salvation. So as we share the gospel, man, people come to Christ, people begin to respond. I ask you, have you responded to the gospel? Have you believed in Jesus? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? This is what Paul the Apostle was all about. As he went out on his first missionary journey and founding these churches, he was evangelizing the lost. And we must be a people evangelizing the lost. I truly believe we don't have a lot of time left. I believe Jesus could come back at any moment. And I believe that we need to be about our Father's business and sharing the gospel. Secondly, going back to Acts chapter 14, Verse 21, not only did he evangelize the lost, number two, he equipped the saints. Look what it says. And when they preached the gospel to that city and made what? Disciples. They returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. So man, Paul the Apostle is wrapping up the journey. He's been out a year. And prior to leaving those churches, not only did he want to found them in sharing the gospel, but he also wanted to establish them and rooting them and grounding them in the faith. Discipleship is what Paul the Apostle was all about. Now, up until this point, from Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 14, that term discipleship was used some 16 times. They made disciples. Jesus, prior to his ascension, looked at the disciples and said, you're to go into the world and make disciples. And let me just say this, a couple of things about being a disciple. Number one, it takes time. Did you know that? It takes time to be a disciple. It takes time growing in our relationship with Jesus. In fact, it is possible, scholars believe, that Paul and Barnabas have remained all winter in Derby and waited for the roads and the mountains to clear from the snow line. If that was the case, they had ample time to root and ground these new believers in the word of God. We also know at least one of the disciples that ended up accompanying the Apostle Paul on his third missionary journey came from the area of Derby, and he's mentioned in Acts chapter 20, verse 4, as Gaius. In addition to that, we also know Timothy, who became an assistant to the Apostle Paul, was from the area of Lystra and Derby, and so at least two men from this time of laying a foundation, two of them went on to be effective in ministry and went on to bear fruit to the glory of God. So we see the importance of taking time and investing our lives in others so that they would be established in the faith. Being a disciple, growing as a disciple, it takes time. In addition to that, let me also say it also absolutely a prerequisite is the word of God. You want to grow in Christ? Get into the word of God. Paul the apostle took the time to establish them in the scriptures. Jesus would say in John chapter 15, verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and I shall, it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples, Jesus said. Being a disciple is the word of God abiding in me, and I abiding in the word of God, and finding myself following Jesus as a result. So Paul the Apostle not only sought to evangelize, but he, saw, he sought to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Let me ask you this. As a disciple, are you growing in your hunger for the Word of God? As the Apostle Paul took the time to establish them. I can't imagine what that must have been like, you know, being in those cities, being with those people, leading them to Christ, baptizing them, bringing these new comforts to a place of expounding the scriptures to them and watching Paul, watching Paul share the word of God. I mean, this guy was a master of the Old Testament, you know, going from Genesis all through the Old Testament, showing them that was Jesus. The bronze serpent in the Old Testament, that was Jesus. The Passover lamb, that was Jesus. And, and, and showing systematically through the Old Testament, all of these were shadows and pictures 
pointing to the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ. He established them in the word of God. And as a result, they were vibrant, healthy people. A.W. Tozer said, a whole Bible makes a whole Christian. Being well grounded in the word of God. Well grounded in the word of God. I, I, I remember when I first got saved and I was taken to the room, you know, for, you know, to share with me some basic truths about your newfound faith. You've received Jesus. You've been born again. Here's some things you need to know. And one of the things that was told to me, and I share with you, is a prerequisite to spiritual go- growth is, is getting into the word. You know, I didn't have a Bible, you know. I didn't have a Bible. I didn't have any kind of spiritual material to help me. So they gave me a New Testament. They gave me a New Believers Growth Book. And they encouraged me in the faith. They said, keep coming to fellowship and, and get into the scriptures. And so as I did, you know, I went home and I asked, hey, do we have a Bible here? You know, that big old family Bible, man. The thing was like a monster, you know, Bible. The, the font was like 48, you know. It's like <laughs> massive Bible. It's like get a hand truck, bring that thing in, you know. But then they told me, listen, um, you, you know, that's, that's great. That's awesome. If you have a hard time seeing, that's great. You know, size, font size 48, awesome. But you might want to get a study Bible. So I was instructed what a study Bible was and the importance of reading through the Word of God and, and going through line by line, verse by verse, and reading the commentary on areas that I didn't understand. And I started to grow. You're going to grow if you find yourself investing in the Word of God. The Apostle Paul made it very clear here that one of the essentials was evangelism. Another essential was equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. And through the course of my my years walking with Jesus, I found Romans chapter 12, it says that the word of God renews the mind. It renews the mind. The Bible tells us that the word of God is like food. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. That proceeds from the mouth of God. Those of you in this room that want to find victory, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, this is how you overcome temptation, by the word of God abiding in you. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 2, it says that we're to desire the word of God as newborn babes that you may grow thereby. It's God's word. Do you have a hunger for God's word? Paul the Apostle wanted to make sure that they were founded in that. I read the story years ago of a young French girl who had been born blind. After she learned to read by touch, a friend gave her a braille copy of Mark's Gospel. She read it so much that her fingers became callous and insensitive. And so in an effort to regain her feelings, she cut the skin from the ends of her fingers. Tragically, however, her calluses were replaced by permanent scars. So she soberingly gave the book a goodbye kiss, saying, Farewell, sweet word of my heavenly Father. In so doing, she discovered that her lips were even more sensitive than her fingers, and so she spent the rest of her life reading her great treasure with her lips. Reading the word of God with her lips. That's a hunger for God's word, folks. That's somebody that wants to go deeper in their relationship with Jesus. And I ask you, as I ask myself, are we going deeper in our walk with Jesus? Are we hungering after God's word? I read another story of a man by the name of Michael Bellister. He was a Bible distributor who visited a small town in Poland shortly after World War II. Bellister gave a Bible to a villager who was converted by reading it. Do you know that God's word is able to bring people to saving faith by just reading it? Just reading God's word? He leaves the Bible in this village, and people began to respond to the message. The new believer then began to pass the book to others. The cycle of conversions began to grow as 200 people eventually became Christians as a result of one Bible. That's amazing. One Bible. When Bellister returned in 1940, this group of Christians met together for a worship service As he began to preach the word, he gave an opportunity if they wanted to share their testimony, but rather than share their testimony, he asked if they wanted to recite a scripture. One man stood up and he said, perhaps we've misunderstood. Did you mean verses or chapters? These villagers had not 
memorized a few select verses of the Bible, but whole chapters and books. Thirteen of those villagers knew Matthew, Luke, and half of Genesis. Another person had committed to memory the whole book of Psalms. Could you imagine memorizing the book of Psalms? I struggle with Psalm 115 if you know that song. That's like three verses. Could you imagine memorizing Psalm 119? This person knew God's word. All of Psalms? That's amazing. That's a zeal, a hunger for God's word. And I think if we're going to be well-trained, well-founded Christians, we need to be in God's word. This is what Paul wanted to make sure, that these churches were healthy and strong by encouraging them to evangelize the lost. Secondly, by equipping the saints with the word. Thirdly, look at verse 22. They encouraged the church to expect hardship. It says that they returned to Lystra. Iconium, Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So prior to Paul leaving, he basically turns to them and he says, listen, you've you've come to Christ. You're growing in Christ. You're well-founded now in the word. There's something else I need to encourage you on. And he exhorted them that because they're following Jesus walking against the tide of this world, seeking to be contrary to the culture in which they live, he said, expect opposition. Expect, he uses the word here, tribulation. Now, in your Bible, you want to note that word. It was used frequently in Paul's letters. It's the word philipsis, philipsis. And it speaks of a trial or difficulty that knocks the wind out of you. In fact, in in the times in which Paul wrote, Rome ruled the world, as you know, And when they got a person that was convicted of breaking some Roman law, what they would do, they'd lay them on on their back, they put a board on their chest, and they would lay a rock on that board, and it would crush the air out of them. Philipsis, same word. It It was a circumstance that would crush a person to the point where it knocked the breath out of you. Paul says, in this world, you're gonna go through situations and trials that will seem to knock the spiritual breath out of you, the spiritual, the spiritual life, you need to keep going. You need to keep persevering. You need to keep walking. And he gives them this word of exhortation. Paul would write to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, all who des- desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Jesus said in John's gospel, the 16th chapter, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good courage. I've overcome the world. Here's the good news. As Christians, yes, we will experience trials, but the good news is we won't experience them alone. Jesus will walk us through those things. Jesus will help us through those things. And because Jesus overcame, guess what? You and I can overcome as well. Because the Bible tells us by the power of the Holy Spirit, he'll help us and aid us and give us all that we need. Every resource of heaven made available for you and me in order to live the Christian life. Paul encouraged them. Don't allow your trial to sway you. Don't allow the difficult difficult things of this world to move you. Keep walking with me. As we move on, it says here in verse 23, they not only encourage them to evangelize the lost, equip the saints, exhort them to endure. But uh, fourthly, they enlisted leaders in verse 23. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And so as Paul is now wrapping up the first missionary journey, he needed to establish leadership in order for him to go back to ascending church. Paul realized, I can't leave these new believers like this. Leaders need to be raised up. I need to pass the work on to these leaders, and then I can go back and give a report of all that God has done. And so he, he raises up leaders. Now, in your Bible, note the word that he uses. He appointed elders. Elders. Now, later on, we're told in 1 Timothy chapter 3, the apostle Paul gives us specific instruction 
when it comes to ordaining or establishing pastoral leaders. Paul would elaborate on what actually happened here later on in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And in 1 Timothy 3, this is what Paul said. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. The word bishop is the word episkopos. Epi, it literally means over. Skopos means to watch. It speaks of somebody that's wanting to watch over. Somebody that is superintending. Somebody that is wanting to make sure that everything's okay related to the church. Bishop is used related to pastoral ministry. In this context, elder is used. And not to make things more confusing, 1 Peter chapter 5, the word pastor is used. So the question that people ask is, which is it? Are they bishops? Are they elders? Or are they pastors? Biblically speaking, which one is it? It's all of them. It's actually all of them. Here's how it works. The elder speaks of the man's maturity, speaks of the man's spiritual maturity. The bishop speaks of the man's ministry. He's overseeing. The pastor speaks of the man's method. He's feeding the flock. Understand? His maturity as an elder. His ministry as a bishop. He's called to oversee. His method as a pastor is to feed the flock of God. So Paul would would later elaborate on these truths and give us an understanding that all of these words are used interchangeably describing the same person, just different facets of that person's ministry life. So what were some of the qualifications that Paul was looking for prior to leaving these churches and going back to Antioch and Syria? Well, we know for one thing in 1 Timothy chapter 3, they needed to be godly men. Paul would say... To Timothy, they were to be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule the church of his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Paul says they need to be godly. They need to be men of character, men that are set apart, men that are looking like Jesus, men that look like Jesus, godly. Secondly, he tells us that they need to be grounded. Again, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, Paul makes it very clear. They're not to be a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, they fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Interesting, the word novice, it literally means newly planted. They can't be newly planted in the Lord. They need to be seasoned. They need to be well established in the central truths of the Christian life. And, of course, this alludes back to the term elder. I mean, make, make sure that the leaders that you put in place are grounded and rooted in the word of God. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22, Paul would say, lay hands on no one hastily. It's easier to put someone in than take someone out. You gotta be very careful that you're selective, that you watch, you wait, you prayerfully consider what people you're putting in position of leadership because they need to make, you need to make sure that they're ready for it. They're grounded men, they're godly men, and thirdly, they're gifted men. They're gifted men because in 1 Timothy 3, verse 2, they were to be apt to teach. They needed to be able to be apt to teach. And the gifting of the Holy Spirit should be upon their life. And so Paul the Apostle, prior to leaving these churches, he encouraged them with evangelizing the lost, equipping the saints to be disciples, exhorting them to endure hardship, and fourthly, he wanted to make sure that he enlisted leaders so that the work could be passed on to those leaders. Number five, and this is the last point here, verse 23, they entrusted the work to God. It says, that, it says there that they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And they said, all right, leaders are now in place. We're going to pass the work now to them as they made their way back to Antioch in Syria. And I do think there is an application for us here uh, and that, Every ministry, every ministry must come to a point of recognizing that this is the Lord's work. 
we're committing this to the Lord. Jesus is the head of the church, and these are God's people. They've been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm an under-shepherd. I'm a servant within the church, and I need to recognize that Jesus is the foundation, and I'm entrusting that he's going to build his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's what Jesus said. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Verse 24, after that, they passed through Pisidia. They came to Pamphylia. Now, when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Attilia. From there, they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. And when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them so that, and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And so they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Man, this was it. Wrapping up the ministry, they come back after being out for a year and they gather the church together to give a missions update. You can imagine, you know, you know, we have mission updates here at, at the church and can't imagine, you know, if Paul had, um, you know, access to a projector, you know, could you imagine everybody gathering together? This was it, you know, this is what happened. Me and Barnabas went out and um, John Mark went with us. So the first obstacle, he left us. That's the first slide. Next slide. Um, you can imagine, you know, the next slide, you know. Um, yeah, we went into the city. We shared justification by faith and there was a group of Judaizers that didn't really agree with what I was teaching and so they decided to follow me from every city to wreck everything that I was trying to do next slide that's me on the floor getting stoned by the people of that city right there (laughs) next slide can you imagine but he reported to them all the things listen what God did through them churches were established people were born again Lives were radically and forever changed. And then Paul says this. He qualifies it all, and I love this. It's a pretty amazing statement. Paul says here, Paul reported how God opened the door for ministry in those cities. Why is that significant? Because when you go back to read the chapter, it kind of redefines what an open door looks like. Some of us in this room right now are under the impression that an open door is when ministry is firing on all cylinders, when fruit is just falling on the floor, when the spirit is moving and God is just working. And we limit an open door to that. Paul redefines an open door here as actually it's opposition, it's warfare, it's pressing through the difficult times, it's continuing to do what God's called us to do, that can be an open door as well. Maybe you're here this morning and you felt like, man, you know what? I've been obedient. I've done what God's called me to do do, and it's been hard. And I'm wondering, is this an open door? I'm wondering, man, Lord, is this you leading? Is this you guiding? Listen, just because it's hard doesn't mean it's, it's not an open door. So prayerfully consider that. Prayerfully consider. So he wraps up the trip, encourages the church back in Antioch of Syria. And the whole chapter is Paul persevering in the ministry of missions. By the power of the Spirit, much of their success was largely due to persevering in evangelism, persevering in equipping the saints, persevering in exhorting the church to endure hardship, persevering in enlisting leaders and then persevering and entrusting the work to God. That was it. And as a result, God blessed. God blessed. That's the role that we want to follow. That's the role model that we have to follow is, man, just keep doing what God's called you to do. Just keep doing what God's called you to do. So with that, we're going to move into a time of communion. Father, we thank you for your word, and as we wrap up Paul's first mission, we pray for just the various things that we've discussed thus far, that you would write those things on the tablet of our heart. Lord, would you give us, including me, Lord, just give us a a sense of urgency that we're living in critical times and people need Jesus. Jesus.
Would you grant us this week as a church family open doors to share the gospel, open doors to reach out in the love of God. And I pray for anybody right now in this room that's never accepted Jesus, they've, they've never been born again, I pray that you draw them to yourself right now. Maybe you're here and you would say, you know, I've, I've gone to church, I know a lot about religion, but I've never actually asked Jesus personally to forgive me of my sin and enter into a relationship with him. I've never done that. Well, the Bible says right now Jesus is knocking on the door. He's calling you to, to himself. And I want to encourage you to take that step of faith and say, Jesus, I believe. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose from the dead. And on this day, I'm surrendering my life to you. If you'd like to do that, let me lead you in a word of prayer. Just say this prayer, meaning it with all of your heart. Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I confess I'm a sinner and I need you as my savior. Thank you that you died and paid the penalty for my sin and that you rose again. And I surrender my life to you from this day forward. Help me to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.